Charlie, what is your secret to Fountain of Youth? When I was young, I was trying to shorten my life, not extend it. I was afraid that I would spend too much time at the end drooling into a cup or something in the nursing home, and I wanted to cut that part of life short. So I always ate plenty of whipped cream and <laughs> animal fat and sugar and so forth, and it didn't work. I just kept living and living and living. <laughs> So, so finally I, I started to think a little bit about it and I, a friend of mine took over Harvard for a long session to celebrate a, a birthday. And there was a famous medical school professor from Harvard there. And I said, you know, he says, in my golf foursome, two of us outlived everybody else. And we both grew eight inches in the first year of college. Is there any correlation between late poverty and puberty and long life? And the great man from Harvard, who was Atoll Gwandi, said, I don't know. And I went back to Los Angeles, and the next week came a big stack of research. And sure enough, in both men and women, the later the puberty, the longer the life expectancy. And I was terribly pleased with myself. <laughs> to have this new knowledge. And I went out the first night and met some lovely young woman of about 60. And I was just brimming with this new knowledge. And I said, do you realize that there's this enormous correlation between long life and late puberty? <laughs> and she looked at me and said, Charlie Munger, you son of a bitch, why did you have to tell me this? Said, I started menstruating when I was 10 years old. <laughs> Charlie, you and Warren have always taught us to be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. 2020, are you fearful or greedy? Well, I don't consider this a time when an idiot could get rich just by doing practically anything. And of course, there's a lot of idiocy going on at the moment and misbehavior. So it always fearful. creates danger for the unwary. So Stuart, are you fearful or greedy at this time with your investments? I'm beyond fearful. <laughs> Maybe I'm over ex exaggerating this, but I see a lack of um, responsibility in investing both in the public and private area and, and with the governments around the world. Basically, my belief was we're subsidizing the economy it's going to come back to haunt us. Mayor, are you fearful or greedy? I'm always greedy. I'll tell you what I did in 2008, other than talking to Charlie, but I did the same thing I did in the mid-70s. I'd, I'd look at the smallest companies and then say, is that company going to be around in five years? It may be selling for three times earn, earnings, but it probably may not be around in five years. But if I think it's going to be around in five years, I grab it and I buy it and I buy as much as I can. And it worked. <laughs> Charlie, you, you've said that if you take out the handful of companies like you, you were mentioning from Berkshire Hathaway, the return would be pretty much average. When you're making those investment decisions, especially those critical investment decisions, you and you know, Warren, your partner Warren Buffett had a such legendary partnership. Do you guys have disagreements, and how do you make those dis uh, decisions? We never have an unpleasant disagreement. Occasionally, we start from the same opposite, the same facts, and have slightly different views. Mm -hmm. And we solve our problem in those occasions by doing it his way. <laughs> <laughs> and some people say to, say to me, how can you be so overbearing and domineering and unpleasant as you are, Charlie, and be in a subordinate position when you're dealing with Warren. And I say, well, Warren is not a normal human being. He is worth being a little subordinate to. He is really quite able. So, uh, Charlie, you started as a meteorologist. Well, that's what the Army made me into, <laughs> the Army Air Corps. Yeah, yeah. And then you went to Harvard Law School. Yes. How, how, and then you, you became one of the best investors in our lifetime. 
and you have such a record. Uh, I think your your investment firm did like a triple of what the market did for 14 years straight. How do you how do you make those decisions, investment decisions? For I have a very simple year? system. I call it organized uncommon sense. All I do is take conventional sense and strip the asininity out of it. And then I have uncommon sense because most people use conventional sense instead of uncommon sense. Give so my whole example. method of operation is just to avoid asininity. I don't succeed 100%, but I succeed more than most. Stuart, you have such, you're, you're like known to have such nose for good deals. What does a good deal smell like? <laughs> no, I think I try to keep it, think about it simply. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what people do when they look at uh, acquiring companies, they, they're very focused on the history. And I kind of say the history is only interesting what's going to happen in the future. So I, I look at futures and think, you know, uh, can I bring some skill to it? something special that'll make a difference. Um, and then it's hard work. It's, you know, look, the truth is it's execution. Yeah. I mean, you can um, uh, give me great execution and fair strategy, and I'll beat great strategy and fair execution every time. Mm -hmm. So I think you need a reasonable asset, but then you got to work at it. You have to have patience, and you have to, I mean, it, to me, it's common sense, which is unfortunately not very common. Sure. The opportunities in life are going to be rare because that's the nature of the human condition. And that the best and wisest are only going to get a few big opportunities. And you really have to step up to the pie counter and take a big helping when you get your small share. And I've been very good at that. So what does the opportunity look like? It looks like a sure thing. <laughs> Where would you invest your grandchildren's money? The very word diversification, which is taught in every business school, is the holy golden grail. I consider almost asinine. I'm only interested in investing where I have some sort of advantage. And, and of course, that means I can't do the conventional things. And if I have the advantage in three different things, that's enough for any family three wonderful things with the odds in your favor. I mean, do you want egg in your beer in life? And so I think the idea you have to have a big diversified, port, that's fine for the ignorant people to be fully diversified. But if you actually know what you're doing, I think three investments are plenty. And the mongers, if you take Berkshire and Costco and Lilu's Asian fund, that's 90% of the money. I have been blessed with some very remarkable partners, and of course that really helps. But I have a secret trick that you can all play. How do you get a marvelous partner? Mm. It's a very simple trick, and here's what you do. You deserve a marvelous partner. By the way, it works in marriage too. It's a very simple formula. That's, that's very, very wise. Thank you. Yeah. There's so much wealth disparity in this world, and what are your thoughts? And I think also a lot of our young people, our youth, are fascinated with the socialism. Uh, they're talking about, you know, basic, universal basic income and a lot of the socialist concepts. What are your thoughts about wealth disparity of people who are very wealthy and, and there's still a lot of poverty in this world and what are your thoughts about socialism? Charlie, would you like to start the conversation? Well, it's not hard for me to be against socialism. When the Chinese had the land farmed in socialism, they were starving. And, and finally, a bunch of starving Chinese peasants got together and said, we're, each one of us is gonna take a farm for his own self. And even if we die, we're going to do it. And so they divided up the farms with each one having his own farm. And of course, the grain production went up like 20 times in the first year. And in, in a world where something like that can happen, if you're a, a pure socialist, you're a nutcase, an absolute nutcase. And 
and not a modest nutcase, a real nutcase. So, so somebody like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, both of them very smart people and both quite admirable in some ways, but they just never quite learned what Adam Smith, just some basic facts of life they didn't learn. We can't help, if we want a productive society, we can't help but have these personal incentives to handle your own affairs. And if you do that, you get unequal, unequal wealth out outcomes. So it's a, the price of plenty is, is that you can't have socialism. That does not mean that the rich societies of the West can't have a bigger so social safety net than they do. That's a perfectly permissible way to think. In fact, I would argue that it's evil not to be in favor of a reasonable social safety net if you're an affluent nation. And, and, uh, and I don't think it matters a lot whether the top tax rate is 38% or 42% or 26%. I think when you get income taxes 60, 70, 80%, you get total perverse behavior and you start hurting the economy. Mm -hmm. So even if it would serve your sense of egality, what it'll do is reduce the amount people are eating. So I, I think it's pretty, pretty simple. And of course we've got to have capitalism. And of course somebody like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren is a little nuts. And they've got high IQs too. But one thing I've noticed in a long life is that you can be a perfect nut with a high IQ. <laughs> That's going to the quote book, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mayor, what, what are your thoughts about argument for the wealth disparity? Uh, Eli Broden, I had an op-ed piece about a year or two ago, which said, is it a sin to be rich? And then we said it. I know what Eli would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> but we said is, if you spend a significant part of what you make to charity and another significant part to creating jobs. Yeah. And you're not building, putting it there to build boats or houses or what. What do you think? Well, it makes the economy run by yeah. doing, creating jobs and, and spending more money by making more money. Okay, what would Eli say, Charlie? <laughs> well, I don't think Eli thinks it's sinful to be as rich as Eli. Well, he has done a lot of leverage philanthropy. Uh, I, I believe in that, but... It's... Well, the thing wonderful up here is all of us have put large amounts of money into sure. charity. I'll tell you something else. Each of us, in the end, are going to part with it all. <laughs> <laughs> you win, Charlie. How much, of, how much am I really giving away when it's all going to go away so soon anyway? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's a, I don't think they gave me some honors recently for making a gift and I said you know I waited until I was way past 90 and then I part with something that I'm soon going to lose anyway I said I, I don't think you're honoring the right person <laughs> <laughs> so Stuart do you have any thoughts on the wealth disparity and the argument for the wealthy yeah I, I get, get, get concerned with the disparity mm -hmm. um and I, I also, you know, the joke is about why socialism doesn't work, because eventually you run out of other people's money, you know. And I think, but I do think that um, we're a little more distorted than one should be. And I think what, 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 how that shows is that luxury items, the differentials become so great. So people, certain people have way too much money. Now, I think if one reinvests it and you build a business, you create jobs, that you know, there's some way to do a better taxation where you can have incentives for creating jobs as opposed to just incentives for making money about it. So, you know, I'm really concerned about the education system here in America. You know, it's the number one economy in the world, and we have a third world education and healthcare. Are we done 
as an America being the number one country in the world? Are we, like, it's like all modern civilizations that, uh, you know, passes a torch from, Ath you know, from Athens to London to all the other countries. Where are we as an America, as an economic power with very poor education and a healthcare system, or do we still have hope? Is that still the best country to bet our lives on? What are your thoughts? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a great company that eventually passes the baton. That has happened to every other great company that's previously existed. Of course, this country, it's going to happen to us in due course. It's as natural as saying that everybody has to die. Great companies have to wane and other companies become great companies. That's just the way the world is. And I think that the place we've all lived and the time we've lived in has been the easiest that any group of humans ever had. So those who found it difficult, all I can say is everybody else has it worse. <laughs> it's been a very easy period based on what our ancestors had. Imagine having half your children die in your presence, which happened to like all previous generations. Think of the agony that that causes. And, and there's just all kinds of agonies like that. I was reading a biography last night of Winston Churchill, another one, and it described the death of his mother. And you know how Winston Churchill's mother died? She fell on the stairs, as well, she please all you old people. She broke her leg. In the course of fixing her leg, they got it infected. In the course of cutting off her leg because it was infected, they mishandled it in some way and an artery burst and she bled to death. And, and that was just routine in the old days. Well, the people died needlessly and what was she, 50 years old or something like that? And, and just unbearable agonies. And of course, so, I, I, we, we had this enormous wealth creation in our lifetimes and in the best country in the best place. I mean, we really had it the best. It was still pretty hard at its worst moments, as we can all attest. Uh, but, uh, but I don't think you should worry about the fact that some other country is going to be more powerful. Of course that will happen. And hell of an after I was dead, I don't think it's gonna bother me very much. <laughs> So we're safe. <laughs> what, what do you think, Mayor? Well, I think California is the wealthiest and the most difficult one to live in because the taxes, mm -hmm. the cost of the atmosphere, the cost of gasoline, of everything is crazy. And sure, we're getting wealthy people from other countries are coming over here regularly, yeah. particularly the Chinese and others, but I really fear in the long run how they're, uh, we're gonna do here. Now, what I tell everybody, I'm, I'll be 89 next week, but. Congratulations, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Cheer up, I regard you as one of the rising young men. <laughs> okay, so he's not, you're 90. He's 94, I think. 95, right? 95, yeah. Yes, he just turned 95. But, yeah. And you have amazing skin. <laughs> well, I, I want to get your skin care, Charlie. I, I don't know what you have on your face, but you, you have amazing skin. Well, if you're fat enough, the wrinkles don't show. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I advise people, if you're 50 years old, you ought to think of moving to someplace else. If you're as old as I am, stay in California and have fun with whatever wealth you have. Yeah, well, thank you. Stuart, what are your thoughts? Um, look, I, I think our education is, is um, sort of bifurcated, mm -hmm. that we have the best universities in the world. Yes. And the, and, but the problem with that, again, is that um, there's more people who want to go and less people can go to the best universities. Right. The, the, the and amount, they don't I mean, turn in smart at 17 midnight to go to our universities right. by having bad K-12 education. And that's going to cause more of this uh, sure. differential between the wealthy and the poor because yeah. the We're wealthy... We're a knowledge economy. Well, knowledge. And, I mean, yeah. again, what you see now, 
But what we've seen is if you give, if, but you can create good education, and we've done it in the Central Valley, and, and, and that's one of the things I'm most proud of. And we've, um, in our charter school, and again, I give Linda credit for this, in our charter school, we have um, like over 80% of the kids, and these are first generation kids not selected, and over 80% are going on to a four-year college. And, um, and the other thing is, and we give scholarships to all these kids that graduate our, our, our charter school, and we get them into good schools. I mean, we've had kids to go to Harvard and Duke and University of California, and I mean, they're, and, they're, and they do well, and, and out of that, the other thing is 70, I think over 70 percent, so what is it, 75? 75% of our kids finish the four-year college in five years, which is unheard of. This is first-generation kids. So what I'm saying, this can be done. It just takes a lot of effort, and, and it's not just money. It's not the money. It's, it's really understanding. It's running it like a business, and so we've focused on that. So that can be done. However, the problem is... Um, those opportunities aren't available for all. I mean, in the inner city, it's selective, and I don't have the answer, but it's certainly a problem. But as far as us not being, I, I agree with Charlie, it's not that important to be the number one country in the world, and it will cycle. Mm -hmm. And we've been in, in it for a long time, and again, I don't know how you, or how we think we can, over the long term, compete with China, who has what, four or five times the number of people. Sure. And I've had a lot of experience. I've been doing business in China f since 1985. We had factories there. And let me tell you, those people work hard, and their expectation against what they're willing to do to make it is much different than what's happening here in the U.S. Well, how do you feel about our governor saying that he's going to vote to have that charter schools are not allowed in California? Well, hopefully he won't do that. He's told us he won't. Now, well, let's see what happens. I he would think it would be a won't. terrible thing. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. that was before he was elected. <laughs> yeah, well, teachers' unions are so powerful, yeah. so he had to do it political reasons. So since we're talking about politics before the dinner, let's finish the politics conversation. I think, Charlie, that's your favorite subject. <laughs> it's not my favorite group of people. So, you know, our president says that he is doing this very, not so very eloquent tweets by saying there's so much fake news, there is, you know, biased media, and that's the reason why he is using Twitter as, as a medium to communicate. A lot of his tweets, like, makes us a little bit cringe, but also we, um, we have so much biased in media and news out there. Where do you get your information? Where do you get your accurate, unbiased news? I don't get any accurate, unbiased news. If, I, if there's any unbiased in my news, I'm, I'm supplying it myself. <laughs> no, I, I, as a matter of fact, I've gotten so I find the ordinary news boring. So I flesh, I f switch from one idiot to another. <laughs> and since we have one on each side of every issue, it's more interesting and it, so I'm old, like and I, I like the blood to stir a little, and so <laughs> I, I never go near the ordinary news. I go where these biased people are talking, but I, but I, but I listen to all of them. They're colorful. Sure. So it's research when you hear, listen to all of them. Yes, and, and uh, they're witty in kind of a nasty way. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine calling... Elizabeth Warren Pocahontas. You know, you may not like Donald Trump, but he has a genius for rhetoric. <laughs> Nobody has ever done more damage to another human being with one little pet name. <laughs> Pocahontas. <laughs> what is the best advice that you've received? And can you share that with us? Well, I think if you can invest and compound that investment, you can... You make 8% and you take 4% and, and put it into the next investment, which is not easy. The best thing I can say is treat your employees 
in a holy way, in a beautiful way. <laughs> Expect them to work hard, but also make sure that they do well. Thank you, Mayor. That's great advice. Thank you. Charlie, I'm sure you have. Well, I think I have an everlasting recipe, and that is to cope with whatever comes and work very hard at being rational. I really think if you talk about evil and mischance in the world, more trouble is caused by stupidity than is caused by malevolence. And so working constantly on the stupidity side of things is hugely constructive and it's fun too. Uh, there's so much asininity out there, you can go hang out. And it's kind of fun to bat it down and, and serve the rational outcomes. So uh, I think if you just cope with what comes and try and be rational all the way, that's all it's given us to do. Thank you. Stuart. Yeah, I think a um, bit of advice that I had that, that I try to look at is everybody's always looking at the upside. And I found that, you know, you have plans and the plans never work, okay? Let's, you know, sometimes they're better, sometimes they're worse. But I think the important thing is you worry about the downside. If you don't lose any money in, in, in any investments or businesses, that's a big benefit. I mean, if you make 15%, it's great. But if you make 7%, it's not so bad. But if you lose 20%, it's very hard to make that up. So when I look at a deal, I say, okay, I understand the upside. You know, tell me about the upside. That's interesting. What's the downside? What's the worst that can happen within reason? And that's what I look at to make sure that you don't get burned. And I've been burned, but uh, hopefully not too often. We have learned so much today. We have been so inspired through your wisdom and everything that you've shared about your wealth, your life, and your stories. So thank you so much for being here today.